I'd like to give a content warning before I start this episode. I'm going to end up discussing sexual misconduct, including sexual assault, in relation to the film I'm discussing today. If that's not something you feel like you can listen to right now, I won't blame you if you skip this episode. Hello, my name is Amber and this is You Look Like a Badger, a podcast where I discuss queer cinema. Welcome to season three. This is officially the first episode back after the new year. I'm adjusting to the change quite well. I've already released a bonus episode, <laughs> completely off schedule, but we are we are back. We're back on track now. And this is the season where I'm going to be discussing international cinema, predominantly non-English language LGBT films all around the world. And I am looking forward to doing a bunch of research. The research that I've done for this episode has been quite intensive. I've essentially made my entire life revolve around this film, these actors and this director, unfortunately. But I do also think I have quite a bit to say. So hopefully this is a very meaty episode. I'm going to be discussing today, blue is the warmest colour. Blue is the Warmest Colour is a now fairly infamous romantic drama based on a graphic novel of the same name written by Jules Moreau, then adapted by Abdelatif Kashish and co-written by his wife Galia Lacroix. The film follows teenage Adele, played by Adele Exarchopoulos, through her adolescence and into adulthood and focuses on a relationship with Emma, played by Lea Sado, an older artist with blue hair who causes her to question her sexuality and the way she expects her life to look. This film has been very controversial in its depiction of sex, with many critics holding the opinion that there is too much of it, punctuated by the allegations of poor working conditions and treatment during filming. At an epic three hours long, the film attempts to cover the scope of lesbian girlhood, class divisions, the purpose of art and what it means to be in love with someone who has power over you, with varying degrees of success. This film won the Palme d'Or at the 2013 Cannes Film Festival, with Exarchopolis and Sido also receiving the award as a special prize. The film won the International Federation of Film Critics Prize and the Louis Deluc Prize for Best French Film. It was nominated for the Best Foreign Language Film Award at the 71st Golden Globe Awards, as well as the BAFTA Award for Best Film Not in English Language. At the 39th Caesar Awards, the film received eight nominations, with Exarchopolis winning the Caesar Award for Most Promising Actress. It has a critic score of 88% and an audience score of 85% on Rotten Tomatoes, and a letterbox score of 3.3. Typically at this point, what I'll do is I'll go to Letterboxd and I'll look at the most popular reviews. However, this film has been discoursed to death, so the most popular reviews are mostly from people very angry at the film. And I'm going to get into like their specific anger as I discuss the film. But I think the problem with a film becoming a piece of discourse rather than an actual film to analyse is that it kind of strips it all of being able to engage with the text as it is. I wanted to find reviews that actually discussed the content of the movie. Whilst I do think the discussions about the director's treatment of his actors and crew members is important, it has somewhat overshadowed what people actually think of the, the film. There's discussions of like should you even bother doing an analysis of a film by a disgraced director? I don't have the energy or capacity to answer that question. I'm more concerned with the, I guess, like the impact this film has had on culture and like the physical impact, I guess, is that Letterboxd is kind of unusable when it comes to like reading the most popular reviews because you kind of just get the same opinions over and over again. It's too long, there's too much sex in it, it's offensive to lesbians, the director's a creep and it's not realistic. Those are like the main criticisms that keep 
popping up in the most popular reviews so if I put them here I don't know that I'd have anything that interesting to say about them. There is a large chance that you already know everything that's already been said about this film because it's probably one of the most famous lesbian films of the like the past decade at least but for me it was like the only lesbian film that I knew for the longest time. So because something is so popular, it has the annoying quality of <laughs> is there anything interesting left to say about it? When I came to like looking for reviews, I was mostly looking for stuff that had something extra to add because I'm going to get into like the criticisms and what I agree with and what I don't agree with. But just reiterating the same five points again and again is not going to be an interesting podcast in my opinion. And I don't think it's become the best mode of analysis. When it comes to like queer movies, LGBT audiences can feel very protective over their own identities because they are so often misrepresented. So a lot of the opinion about a, a film like this is very much informed by people who went to watch it specifically because it was quote unquote bad representation. I think I had like a similar feeling when I watched Adam, which I watched last year, which is that it became like such a notorious film that a lot of people held a negative opinion about it simply because that's what's expected. So instead of like engaging with it where it's at and pointing out the flaws with it that you actually see, you end up just like reading the discourse being like, oh, that film's terrible. And then just like holding that opinion without actually engaging with it. I don't think everyone is obligated to watch a bad film that they feel like is gonna either like trigger them or make them uncomfortable or make them like feel bad about themselves. That's not what I'm saying. I just feel sometimes that going into a film with the desire to hate it and then ending up hating it and then flooding the reviews with all of that, it makes for a frustrating time when it comes to looking at what the film is doing, what it was trying to do, what it did well and then what it failed at. Like actual analysis gets a bit lost in the discourse. I'm not innocent of this, I've definitely done this in the past. There are several directors that I just don't like their work and every time I watch their work I get annoyed by it and then I'm like why did I even sit down to watch that because I knew I wasn't gonna like it and then I didn't like it. There are times where sometimes it's better to just like not engage and you know it's one of the most popular films of all time. Look at all the awards it's won you know. I know it's not easy. <laughs> when when something like feels like ubiquitous that you have to have an opinion on it but you don't necessarily you can just not watch a film and then that's that's all right those films don't have to be representations of your identity i've recommended more than enough films to to supplement the desire to like watch lesbian cinema you don't have to watch this film even if it is one of the most popular ones just something to consider these aren't necessarily the most popular reviews but they're the ones that i found that i had stuff to say about or that I thought were interesting. So yeah, I'm just gonna <laughs> went off on a bit of a tangent there but we're, we're, we're focused, we're back on. This first review is by Tasha Robinson who says the following. An unsparing slow motion look at the entire course of a relationship beginning with the previous relationships that define and demand it. Director Abdelatif Kashish pushes his camera in close, capturing snotty noses, flecks of misplaced makeup, moles and freckles and imperfections, and every tiny flicker of emotion going through his character's head on a moment by moment basis. It's like a diagram of human emotion and sexuality seen from six inches away at all times. Something I want to talk about in more detail later, but I'll, I'll bring it up now, is that having like gone through Kashish's filmography. I've picked like select films, I haven't watched all of them, but I picked the ones that he co-wrote with his wife because I wanted to like get an idea of the types of stories that he tells. There is this push and pull, I think it's like a skill thing more than anything, of this director wanting to tell very grounded real stories about people to like get inside their heads and view the most like intimate moments but 
not having the faculties to back any of that up by good writing or characterization. And a lot of that has to do with the filming technique that he uses. So he's known for like shooting very long days, shooting one scene for like hours and hours and hours. This idea of the like natural becomes very unnatural when you're having to shoot the same scene over and over again. I think you're allowed to feel the way that you feel about a movie and I, I can't like say no you're wrong and you should feel this way. But I am a little bit puzzled by people who found this film like very intimate because it all felt a bit false. Like, I never felt close to these characters, despite the proximity. It all felt a little bit ironic that I was this far away from Adele Axarchopoulos' face, but I never quite understood what she was thinking, how she was thinking. And in fact, the only kind of moments where I really connected with her character were like decent acting moments, like from the actor. I wouldn't say any of the writing endeared me to this character because it's not really there. And I think that's both the result of like the actual skill of the director, but also the way that this was shot. I don't think it's possible when you're shooting the same scene over and over again to like imbue these characters with humanity because at a certain point it becomes like an exercise in perfection and that is like far from naturalistic. It's quite strange the way this film comes across because it has all the qualities of being like a down-to-earth film. It's got like a handheld feel wall very close up the dialogue is quite conversational but the actual end result the actual meat of the film is very meticulous and not in like a fun or interesting way it's a very flat film in my opinion so when people have these like very intense emotional reactions to it i do come away from it a little bit confused <laughs> We can get into why later on. This next review comes from the user J, who says the personalities of the characters were as dry as a desert. This deserves all the criticism it gets. Unfortunately, have to agree. I enjoy the performances for what they are, but for the most part, yeah, this is not like a film that feels lived in. And I'd argue that it's not really a film about characters or people. It's more about creating a mood, I guess. But I don't know how successful it is at doing that. Because like I said, I didn't really feel it. This last review is from user Rembrandt Q Pumpernickel, who says, Some have complimented the film on its detailed nature, on Abdullah Latif Kashish's close-ups and lingering eye, but I never felt that those details added up to anything or revealed personal passions. I didn't mean to pick reviews that I like agreed with or like got to the heart of the idea of what I was trying to say, but I think that kind of review summed up how I felt. It's a lack of cohesion between form and actual story, I think. There is a desire to come across as naturalistic without actually bothering to put humans in your movie. That's just the long and short of it, I think. That is the spoiler-free section, generally how I feel about the movie. I am about to get into spoiler territory, so here is your warning. You haven't seen this film and it's something that you wanted to watch eventually, even if that's a hate watch, though I wouldn't recommend it because it is long and slow. If you're like seething with rage at the idea of watching this movie, maybe just don't. Maybe maybe just leave it. I think, I think you'll live if you haven't seen the film. You'll be alright. If you didn't want spoilers, then, you know, you can just stop the episode here. You know my opinion. I won't blame you if you, if you don't want to hear any more. <laughs> but yeah. If you have seen it, or you don't mind it being spoiled, then you know, stick around. We got I've got some I've got some shit to talk about. It was for like three weeks we shot and we used different names because we always searching and we haven't choose and Abdelatif shot even when is not when we are not supposed to shot, like for example in the train to go to the set in the street during the lunch so sometimes it was shooting and no one knows so everybody called me by my real name and one day come to me and say like 
does it bother you if I call you Adele? Because I have a lot of shot with this. And uh, uh, moreover, it means justi justice in Arabic language. And I like it. So I say like, okay. And I'm really proud that there is like two titles. Adele's life and the, the blue is the warmest color. So I think a good place to start because I have already kind of started talking about it is Abdullah Latif Kashish's directorial style, his personal style, because in preparation for my rewatch of this film, I wanted to check out some of the other films that he has made. So the films that I watched were The Secret of the Grain, Mechtube, My Love, and Black Venus. And all of these films were both co-written by his wife and they also incorporate a very specific style. If you've never seen any of these films, or Blue is the Warmest Colour, the best way I can describe it is that it's a series of long takes often in close-up, often very focused on the human body, particularly women's bodies. The dialogue is generally more conversational, but it does veer off into more philosophical pondering. And they're usually concerned with issues of identity, mostly related to class, but with Black Venus there is a very heavy emphasis on race. Similarly with The Secret of the Grain and in this film there is a focus on lesbians. I guess the desire to present an unfiltered reality is not a new thing but the extent that his films feel lived in or feel real is something that I'd like to interrogate. B. Ruby Rich stated about Kashish's style that is heavily influenced by the new realism of a post-Amelie French cinema, yet concerned with the oldest subject around, young love and coming of age. When interviewed about his decision to make this film, he said the following, my aim was to let my intuition guide me so that these two people would not be seen as two women, but just two people. Very quickly, I forgot the fact that these were two women, just as the crew and everyone else involved in the creation of this film forgot that aspect of it. It was really a film about two people having to go through a relationship which everyone knew would lead to a breakup and the pain that that entails. He continued in an interview with Cinephile saying, when I'm directing, I don't really feel that I'm male or female. It's much more about having a temperament of an artist. I'm more interested in looking at the world with an artist's sensibility. When watching his films, I really did find that there was a desire to engage with identity politics and discuss being marginalised, but no real insight into what that would mean. And a kind of childish idea of presenting this artistically. So there's a real sense of control. I'll put that in air quotes, but it's not considerate control, I don't think. I don't believe that simply lingering on an endless conversation is inherently artful. And I think there is sometimes when you're making art, especially when you believe that what you're making is very good, a desire to like shut out all criticism and just allow yourself to express yourself no holds barred, right? But I would argue that constraints are very good for art. I think having to work within a certain parameter is good for the work you make. And I think you can really tell that Kashish is not someone who has ever had to do that <laughs> because it's not the fact that his films are very long. They are, but it's more that that space is not filled with this like intense emotional art that he seems to want to make. There is like a distance between the actual skill of the filmmaker and the work that ends up at the end. And you know, a lot of it does just seem to be a matter of taste, I guess. But I do think it's it's interesting that a straight man decided to take on a project about lesbian love and did not seem to know 
what to do with it beyond his own ideas of what women are and what women talk like because like I said presenting reality and then actually knowing what these people would say are like two very different things and because he's someone who does like hundreds of takes the end result being as flat and out of touch with the actual queer experience kind of says a lot because it doesn't seem as though he was actually interested in the minutiae of real life but instead this intensely controlled voyeuristic idea of what lesbian womanhood is. So I was reading a book called Safism on Screen, Lesbian Desire in French and Francophone Cinema written by Lucille Kearns, who said the following, It is still broadly true that mainstream French cinema privileges depoliticize art and tends to downgrade movies premised on identity politics. And I have found this to be true when watching French films. There does seem to be a little bit of a disdain for the kind of identity politics that would make films like this one but also like many others that I've seen a lot more fleshed out full-bodied less glib I guess because in a vacuum I don't necessarily believe there should be a limitation on who can direct a film about a specific group of people if you are going to do that you do actually have to respect the process of creating that world of living in that world and this idea that anyone should be able to direct this film. By that own logic, there is no reason why a lesbian director wouldn't have done a good job at this film. A big setback of having a particular style or feeling like you have to stick to a particular style means that adding stuff in that makes it easier to comprehend feels like a slight against the artist or whatever but some big issues with Kashish's style is that he favors these long takes and this detail right but all of that kind of overshadows more simple things that I guess would immerse the audience more in the film because I think from what I've read he seems to believe that he's presenting like reality but for me, I found it really hard to get a clear sense of time. I don't know how long the relationship between Adele and Emma lasts, for example. I don't know how long Adele is with Thomas. Is it three days? Is it a month? Is it a year? I legitimately don't know. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we spend most of the film about six inches from Adele X Arcopolis's face. <laughs> And it's a very beautiful face, but there is just like a lot of elements of world building that just aren't done. And like, I'm not in favour of spoon feeding the audience, but there are some things that just would help with the flow and being able to comprehend and invest in this relationship. Because I legitimately don't know if it's like just very intense or if it's taking place over several years. Because it's hard to establish, there's, there's like an emotional distance from what's actually happening on screen. There's also another thing that Kashish seems to do throughout his work and it seems to be like intentionally provoking slash trolling the audience right so he was like very heavily criticized for the way he shoots women for example and then in his later films he decided to up the ante and you know have it all be leering shots of women's bodies one of his unreleased films has apparently had to go through lots and lots of edits because it was very heavily criticised for being mostly, for want of a better word, women's asses, and then that's the whole film. Is there art to that? I don't know because I haven't seen it. Very few people have. There's like a sense of provocation that this is a director that wants to be known for his style, right? So he'll do things that are deliberately ironic or like are there to provoke criticism, but then we'll get angry when people <laughs> go to criticise it. That 
happens with a lot of people i think people are simultaneously very precious over their art but then also believe that they are true geniuses subversives and the only ones who really know what's going on for example one of the first things we see in the film is adele in class reading Marivo, I'm definitely mispronouncing that, so I apologize. Life of Marianne. I've seen other people discuss this scene where one of the students is quoting the book where the character says, I am a woman and I tell my story. And then she's immediately interrupted by her male teacher. There's either a complete lack of awareness or an entitlement to tell any story at any point. Maybe there is some awareness that this is a man trying to tell women's stories, but from several interviews he's given, he has stated that he didn't see this as a, a female story, he just saw it as a story of two lovers. So I'm more inclined to believe that this is just like a choice. <laughs> Whatever inference the audience is meant to get has been completely unintentional but it is quite funny to have someone say I'm going to be the one to tell my story and then have a character interrupt her and cut her off but also be a man telling this story. It's just quite funny. So I did some research, I'll put that in quotes because I mainly just read the, the plot synopsis on Wikipedia. Apologies, I wasn't going to read a whole book for this. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even read the graphic novel so <laughs> The Life of Marianne is a story of a woman writing about her life in notebooks. She leaves them behind and a man finds them and publishes her story. Now, the inclusion of this does seem to indicate at least some self-awareness. There's like a cheekiness to his transgression. He goes to tell women's stories, but then represents women and the relationships between them as catty and unsustainable. Obviously the over-sexualization, which feels like almost a moot point because I feel like it's been discussed over and over and over again. He will repeatedly tell stories that he has no experience with or knowledge of. And his films kind of consist of long winding conversations that are attempts to try and convince the audience of the unobtrusive nature of real life and then use the camera to leer at women's body. There's like an irony. I think Esme Holden put it perfectly in an article that she wrote where she said, the film isn't told from Adele's perspective as it purports to be, it's told from Kashish's. And Michelle Jurgen, who also wrote about this film, said, We are not meant to know the characters, we're meant to watch them, to admire them, and to idealise them. And I think that is a big issue when I'm trying to emotionally invest in this relationship. The style kind of pushes up against the actual romantic elements of the story, which the more I think about the film, there is like a certain anti romance to it as though the form is trying to squash the idea of a happy ending and more like signal that this is going to be meandering and ultimately tragic that what we watched wasn't this deep exploration of human emotion but a story heading one way with no diversions and this i guess is kind of like compounded with the idea that the women in the story, despite being the leading voice of the story, are still under the thumb of the director. And I think that is a big issue, really, because what am I meant to be investing in? What am I meant to be engaging with? His style ultimately undercuts what should be very intimate. Like, I feel like I'm being signalled towards intimacy without being invited in. Manola Dargis wrote an interesting piece that I think a lot of people who are defenders of this film really didn't seem to like, but she had some, some interesting points and I want to just quote her for a second. So she said, I questioned Mr. Kashish's representation of the female body. By keeping so close to Adele, he seemed to be trying to convey her subjective experience, specifically with the hovering camera work and frequent close-ups of her face. Yet early on, this sense of the character's interiority dissolves when the camera roves over her body even while she is sleeping. Is Adele, 
I had to wonder then, dreaming of her own hot body. Despite this idea of an unfiltered representation of reality, long takes, supposedly intimate conversations, I found that mostly I was being invited to gawk rather than to identify with. I wouldn't argue that there are characters in this film and despite the very good performances, it all feels a lot flatter than it probably should be. I did briefly mentioned just before women's asses and once you watch enough of Kashisha's films the amount the camera will just linger on a woman's ass at a certain point just becomes funny because once you notice it it happens all the time <laughs> at a certain point you just have to laugh I do have to discuss Kashisha's conduct in correlation to his personal style. So I've mentioned the long takes and it feeling like uncut and real, but this has kind of come at the expense of actors and crew members who have had to work with him. There is a very large chance that you know chunks of this story. I've done enough research to know that for all intents and purposes, neither of the lead actors nor the, the crew members on Blue is the Warmest Colour have accused Kashish of sexual assault. There was a separate accusation of sexual assault that was levelled against him years later. I think it's really fascinating, I guess, to see like this game of telephone and it turning into misinformation because you might actually be surprised to know that both of the lead actors like the film and they were actually a lot kinder to Kashish than they maybe should have been. They have been a lot kinder in retrospect as well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to collate everything that I have and just like give an account of what is what and what kind of the problem is with foregrounding your technique over concrete labour laws and human rights violations. I'm quoting The Guardian here, who did an interview with Leah Sado and Adele Exarchopoulos. So Sado said, in the scene where we meet for the first time, it lasts 20 seconds on screen. We spent 10 hours working on this scene, I'm not joking. We did 100 takes just of the moment that we crossed paths. In the end, I was just becoming crazy and just started looking at Adele bemused. And Exarchopolis had this to say, Abdel Latif hates fabrication. He wants us to be really smoking a joint and drinking a beer, sometimes too much. He wants to be close to the truth every time. We are drinking real wine in those scenes. The man who plays Emma's stepfather is one of the producers and he was so drunk in one scene. You just listened to his voice and you knew it was unusable. He was so drunk and saying things that weren't the subject of the film. So Sado and Exarchopolis claim that Kashish yelled at Sado to hit Exarchopolis in an argument scene and later told her to lick her co-star snot. In a lengthy statement on French news website Rue 89, he attacks her spoiled child arrogance for making defamatory and unhealthy insinuations and says she'll have to explain herself before the law, suggesting a lawsuit. Kashish goes on to say this, I never showed anyone a lack of respect. I might have shouted sometimes because I thought I'd get somewhere by raising my voice, but I never called anyone names. I'm just normally demanding. In France, you say extremely demanding. Because we French spend our time whinging and moaning, and any other country I'd be considered perfectly normal when it comes to work. Actors aren't paid the same as manual workers. They get the limelight, they stay in fine hotels built by labourers, serviced by cleaners, they get photographers, makeup artists, they swank around in five-star hotels, fly first class and for a pretty enjoyable job of work. Because acting is a game, a very interesting and personally enriching one. It's not like a worker coming home exhausted who just needs to eat spaghetti and go straight to sleep. When it comes to acting, he says, I find the word suffering indecent. So I have two quotes from Leia Sado who said the following in retrospect after working on the film. I'm still very happy with this film. It was hard to film it. Maybe people think I was complaining and being spoiled, but that's not it. I just said it was hard. The truth is it was extremely hard, but that's okay. I don't mind that it was hard. I like to be tested. Of course, I wouldn't work with him again. 
He was so demanding. It was not the process and the fact he wanted to do so many takes, that wasn't the problem. The problem was not the fact that he pushed me. When you're an actress, clearly you want to see your limit. The problem was more between the takes. The fact that you don't see your friends and you have no life, that was difficult. Exarchopolis said in the LA Times that the process of Blue was hard because it was like a documentary. It was exhausting. The time, the takes, the fact we didn't even know how the story will end, by the fact that a lot of different people were getting fired or left the movie, that was hard. Now, now along with the two lead actors kind of revealing what the process of making this film was like, the crew members along with the union that they belonged to stated that the, the working conditions were incredibly hard because the process of making the film was twice as long than it was scheduled to be and they were not paid enough for their time. Many left the film because they were exhausted, because they were pushed to the limits by production. They would end up working 16 hour days when they were declared only eight. On certain positions there would be 11 hour working days paid 100 euros gross while 100 euros net had been promised. It was also pointed out that there were anarchic working hours and that those changed at the last moment with calls by telephone during rest days or at night, change of the work plans from day to day. People didn't know on Friday evening whether or not they were going to have to work on Saturday or the following Sunday. Unfortunately, this conduct was not a learning curve for Kashish and the kind of process of really long days and misconduct on set continued with his film Mektub My Love Intermezzo which I know that I'm pronouncing wrong, I apologise. <laughs> this is the film that hasn't been released so it's the one that is currently, as of recording this, still being edited. I haven't seen the film so I can't really comment on it and I'm having to grasp from other people who did watch it when it came out at Sundance. So I'm going to quote Esme Holden again who says, The sex scenes not only grow longer but are shot unsimulated rather than the use of prosthetic genitals. Lead actors Ophelia Bao and Shane Bao Madin, I sincerely apologise for mispronouncing that, were uncomfortable with this but to quote an anonymous report published in Midday Libre in 2019, by the way of insistence and over time and with alcohol being regularly consumed, Kashish man to get what he wanted. Ophelia Bao stated that her contract was not respected and that she ended up not attending the screening of the final cut of the film specifically because she hadn't agreed to the unsimulated sex scene being edited the way that it was. According to Midi Libre, which Esme Holden just quoted, the director had the disco scenes replayed for hours and hours, exhausting all the actors, and the filming continued very late into the night. He absolutely wanted to have an unsimulated sex scene, which is what the actors were not willing to do. I've been trying to, I guess, like, pass through all this information, and at no point do I want to separate the art from the artist, really. I think I've, I've very much given up on that. This kind of behaviour comes across as someone who believes that his art is more important than the humanity of the people who are essentially helping him to make it. And I think there's this attitude of like the artistic genius, which I would argue just doesn't work in movies because so many people helped you make it. And I'd argue a lot of the people helping you make it are more talented than you. That's obviously just my opinion. I think there's this certain attitude that artists don't see themselves as working in a business, right? They see themselves as like expressing their souls in an unfiltered, transgressive way. And I think that is why they feel comfortable violating labour laws and transgressing the boundaries of their actors to try and get quote unquote their authentic vision into the world. And I think this compounded with the general shittiness male directors have towards the women they work with, the kind of like gendered violence that I suppose a lot of actors have just come to expect. It makes for work that almost feels like out of reality if that makes sense it almost feels fantastical and not in like a fun way <laughs> i mean like at what point when you're shooting a, a coming of age film for a young woman and you are leering at her body 
while she's asleep? Do you stop and think, is this actually how this person would think of themselves? Because this is supposed to be from her point of view. Is this how she would visualize herself? And the conclusion I come to is no. <laughs> and there's just like, for me, a dissonance between the style and the type of director he wants to be and the actual conduct he takes when trying to make something artful. I think I've had more than I probably should ever have had to say about Kashisha's style. <laughs> I've had like so many different thoughts and I wish so much that I had as strong feelings towards the actual movie because what you're going to come to learn is that i actually really struggled to engage with it on an artistic level at all mainly because i think it's a deeply flawed film that cuts out the audience and alienates them in a really weird way From what I've read, Kashish originally wanted to tell a story about teachers and then stumbled across Joel Moreau's novel and then chose to adapt it. And I think you can really tell that this was a story that he had an idea about first and then went back and found like a property to adapt. I think you can actually tell that. For the most part, this is not a love story. And I think trying to engage with it as a love story is a mistake and i think that's why so many people particularly lesbians have like witched off towards it <laughs> because it's not a love story I, I don't i truly believe it's not a love story i think it is a coming of age story i think that that kind of fits more with what it's trying to do i'd say that ironically it's a story about alienation it's about, you know, despite the attempts to immerse us into this young woman's experience, it is a story about a teenage girl who feels isolated from her friends because of her desires. And it's not just her queerness, it's her desire to have intellectual conversations, to talk about the stuff that she reads and not just be asked about whether she has a boyfriend. <clears throat> there is a sense that she views a teenage friendship group as frivolous and throughout the film is like repeatedly emphasized. She has this like insatiable desire to experience the world, to talk about stuff that she likes, talk to people. And I think so much of this film is about her <laughs> just not being understood by the people that she loves. I think this includes Emma, but initially her seeking out an older woman who she views as artistic, not just because of like <laughs> her blue hair, but, but, but the fact that she actually makes art as an avenue to just feel as though she's being listened to as well as like a concentrated symbol of her lesbian desire. As she gets older, this desire doesn't fade and she feels as though she becomes trapped in the role of the muse in her relationship with Emma. There is a pretty solid argument to be made that this is like a fairly standard relationship of like a power imbalance of a young woman being in a relationship with someone older than them with the intent of feeling more adult and then as they grow up feeling trapped in that role in the book cinema and the second sex women's filmmaking in france in the 1980s and 1990s it states that the adolescent girl of the 80s and 90s a frequent trope of mainstream french cinema is more frequently represented as a liter like child woman an object of sexual desire designed to titillate the male voyeur and circumvent the challenge and threat of adult female sexuality. 
So I'd argue that it is less scandalous, I'd say, within French cinema to have a story of a teenage girl expressing herself in very explicit terms and that there is actually quite a long history of teenage characters being portrayed in such a way. By extension, you could argue that Kashish is not really that transgressive at all. So in conjunction, I guess, with being a coming of age story, this, according to Kashish, is a story of class difference. So we see like signifiers of Adele coming from a much poorer background than Emma, which also evidences the power imbalance between the two women. So Adele we see gets the bus and also the train to school. She eats her meals in front of the TV with her parents. She will often speak with her mouth full. She is signified to be the more common of the two women. So I suppose what I'd like to discuss is to what extent is this film simply about class and the lesbian stuff is an afterthought because at certain points it does feel that way particularly because and i've discussed this previously kashish does not see solidarity or unity between women and i've noticed this across his films actually as i mentioned how adele seems a distance from her friends but this is also just like the unwillingness to find the depth in the ways that women relate to each other when men aren't around. So in my opinion, despite his wife also working as a writer on his film, there are very few scenes that felt as though there was an understanding of what relationships between women look like because they mostly consist of conflict and often very violent conflict. Adele attacks one of her friends after experiencing a lot of homophobic abuse at school which is understandable but even before this she seems very like condescending and eye-rolly towards her friends she doesn't seem to like them very much and this is also true in the Mechtub films and also in The Secret of the Grain I noticed he has like frequent scenes of women just insulting each other and that happens just across his films. It does make you wonder why he seemed as in invested in this story as he did. The fact that she comes from a less privileged background is like further evidenced by how politically active she seems to be. She goes to the student protests, she goes to a pride event when she's with Emma. They feel like more superficial indicators of depth but we are meant to get from this that she cares a lot about progress and change and seems invested in a way that Emma often doesn't. Let's talk about Emma. <laughs> opinion Emma seems like kind of a dick <laughs> which is fine you know lesbians can be assholes that happens all the time I mean Tar was a huge success people love that film that film's entirely about a lesbian who is the worst so it's not like against the law that's allowed to happen. It comes with the <laughs> caveat that Kashish doesn't really seem to know or really like women that much. But Emma is meant to like signify the wealthy. She's the more well off of the two. She's able to like be an artist and she doesn't really seem to worry about money or having like a practical career in the same way that Adele does. So I'm going to quote an art from Autostraddle about this film. It says the following. Queer sexuality, particularly female queer sexuality, is all too familiar with the caricature of the enlightened and liberated artist. The ties between that caricature and the idea of lesbianism as sexual experimentation. The trope implies the artist is a lesbian because she has the time and the liberal worldview to play with such realms. And alternative sexuality is a thing that belongs to people of privilege, people of impractical careers and creative mindsets. It can only be playtime to those who aspire to be teachers rather than professors, whose class level has them searching for practicality in their lives, whose narrative is bookmarked by men. So there is this kind of division between the two women and the idea that Adele picks teaching because it's practical and she also ends up being the one who returns to men 
who would be more likely to fit under the term bisexual signifies that there is an impracticality <laughs> to lesbianism within the confines of the film. And that this is also like supplemented with Emma being actively disappointed that Adele doesn't want to be more than a teacher. There's one scene where I think this is one of the only scenes where I think this was actually very artfully done. I didn't feel like it was being rubbed in my face where Adele is making this massive spaghetti meal. She's doing it all by herself and all of these rich artist assholes who, let's be honest, never worked a day in their lives. They come and they eat her spaghetti meal and this whole time she's just like running around trying to make sure everyone's fed. And like I said, time in this film is not clear. I don't know how long Emma and Adele had been in a relationship at this point, but she's still shown to be really quite young. It is a twofold situation where she's in a relationship with someone older than her and has been made to kind of grow up more quickly than she maybe should have done. She's also in a relationship with someone who has never had to work for things and is simultaneously holds all of the power but is quite immature at the same time. Adele is made to behave as though she's like this put upon housewife and even when she's like she's finished making all this fucking spaghetti and she's serving it whilst they are sat around having philosophical debates about orgasms i do honestly like this scene probably the most in the film kashish does seem to on a certain level have a fairly good understanding of power imbalances particularly when it comes to class and the fact that these rich people <laughs> Are just sitting around not even really thinking about the work that has gone into this meal that they're eating like they compliment her and they say oh you should sit down have some spaghetti but it's not a thought to them the real work is the conversation that they're having they're able to lie back and just enjoy the spoils of the labor aren't they rich people can afford to spend their time like this adele can't that's just a truth to her. She doesn't have the time to fuck around. She wants to teach. She's going to work to do that. There is a meal that needs to be made. She's going to make it. There are like clear goals and she, she fulfills them. There is a parallel between a teenager entering a long-term relationship and then growing into an adult and feeling trapped in that relationship and being a poor person having to extend yourself to a rich person's life and feeling as though you're under their thumb. The feeling of being trapped was more evident to me on this rewatch. And whilst I don't support infidelity, I understood it a lot more. It felt a lot less out of nowhere. And I think it's just because when I watched this film for the first time as a teenager, I'd never had a job <laughs> and I never really understood being as pissed off about the amount of stress and exhaustion that comes with being a working person and I do now so someone being just tired of their life and wanting some relief is more understandable to me than I think it was previously so cheating in this sense does make narrative sense like i understand it adele ends up being someone who is made to be domestic before she's had a chance to even live her life and the reaction from emma feels so much more upsetting with all this knowledge i'm not going to use the word grooming i'm not qualified to and i actually don't think it applies here emma is still significantly more mature supposedly she's at least older than adele and yet the reaction she has to this cheating is so violent and upsetting and also incredibly immature where she is hitting her in the face and calling her a slut and a whore and then chucking her out of the house is very upsetting but also very evident of the power in this relationship despite how much Adele might work to make it something nice that she wants to be in it's always going to be this kind of struggle to 
find middle ground that just doesn't really exist between these two people. The scenes are very explicit, but there's something that I don't really get is that why here it's such a big deal, you know, because for example, you don't have problems to show violence, <laughs> things like that. And for me, it's much more shocking than sex. So I don't really uh, maybe understand that, but in a way, it was part of the story, it's part of the passion that we have together. Yeah. I think people are not used to see this, but it was like just a choice about everyone and we were a world. It was also in the comic books at the start, even if it's a free adaptation. And uh, I mean, yeah, it was like, it's a choice to, to treat this scene like the other one and to see the evolution of sexuality because in between these two girls, it's like visceral and or organic. So it was really important to sh show this, not just a cute scene of sex, like the real sex. It is virtually impossible to discuss this movie without also discussing the sex in it and also sex scene discourse in general. According to the London Evening Standard, the main sex scene in this film took 10 days to shoot, which is excessive. Even if there were like technical issues, which there weren't, apparently it was just like shooting over and over and over again. That seems like too much. Lea Sado famously said that she felt like a prostitute when filming this scene, mainly because it just kept going and going. <laughs> And that's kind of true of all the sex scenes in the film. So I'm going to give like the full quote, which I got from The Independent. When she was asked if she was worried that they were merely playing out a male fantasy, she said yes. Of course, it was kind of humiliating sometimes. I was feeling like a prostitute. Of course, he uses that sometimes. He was using three cameras and when you have to fake your orgasm for six hours, I can't say it was nothing. But for me, it is more difficult to show my feelings than my body. When it comes to discussing this film, I feel like the sex in it overshadows all of the conversations and on occasion it does kind of veer off into anti-sex attitudes that disguise themselves as feminist ones. There was this documentary that came out last year called Brainwashed and it was by this director called Nina Menkes about the male gaze and linked the film theory to discussions of real world gender imbalances that you know actors have to experience. I can't really recommend that you watch it mainly because if you are interested in film and already know a lot about the male gaze and film history, you're not going to get that much from it. If you aren't and you would like to know, it's it's a very basic breakdown that is incredibly repetitious. And I'd also say that it's one that doesn't use good examples, particularly when it comes to modern examples of the male gaze. And what I found when watching that documentary is that there's this idea that it's more feminist to depict no sex than it is to have a sex scene in a film or a scene that's like meant to be erotic or titillating. And I found it very frustrating mainly because there has been this attitude towards cinema that has just felt more conservative and it's not a conversation that's being had with a lot of nuance. Like I find the quote unquote feminist arguments to not really consider the specific cases that are being depicted and what they say about gender dynamics and power and desire. They all tend to boil down to if a man was watching this, would he be turned on? And if he would, then it's bad, right? I have become frustrated with how the main conversations of gender seem to present it as more adversarial than anything else. Progress, in the eyes of a lot of these people, looks a lot like getting one over on men or pointing out how something is bad so they should be experiencing it too. And I think my frustration with this is that there are so few avenues in everyday life where it's easy to talk about sex and desire and I think fiction is such a good place to do it. When certain feminists come down very hard on depicting sex on screen and 
boil it down to just the male gaze theory, it becomes incredibly frustrating to engage with it at all because I think talking about how a sex scene is functioning in a film is a really interesting way to look at it. So looking at it simply as a depiction of power imbalances of one person being dominated over another or the way that the male spectator is being satisfied by watching it. I question what it is for because a lot of it just feels like a reaction to very basic tenets of gender liberation and not really engaging with the specifics. So when you don't engage with the specifics, it just makes me feel like you're not as invested in the actual discussion at hand and more invested in sex being immoral in general. And that's annoying <laughs> because I, I, I don't know if I'm the first person to tell you this, but sex is a neutral act. It's a morally neutral act. Not good, it's not bad, it's usually just there, right? You're not going to be <laughs> punished or looked down upon for having it, for liking it, for wanting to watch it. It's okay, that's fine. And I think that is like very important, especially when discussing queerness and gay sex and kink, because there are a lot of people who view all sex as immoral and something only degenerates do, especially if you're not married. But this is laser pointed at the LGBT community who are generally viewed by conservatives as sexual deviants just for the way that they are. So I think it's a complicated issue and I don't enjoy how a lot of this has been boiled down to there is sex in this movie, therefore is a film made for men. As if, you know, no lesbian has ever had sex like this ever. Which has been like what a lot of <laughs> the conversation around this film is that it's not accurate, there are no lesbians involved and I will like get into that because I do want to discuss the specifics of the sex in this film. I just think in general cinema scape becoming more and more conservative is going to be a net negative for everyone but especially for queer people who already really struggle to see themselves in the world. If you don't have access to a queer community in real life your options really are fiction or the internet and the internet is not a particularly safe place for queer people I'd say for a myriad of reasons I think a lot of discussions about sex are relegated to porn which I think is just true for everyone really also like with the internet and our data basically being able to be bought and sold by companies that puts queer people in danger who may not be out to people around them and could potentially be outed in the selling of their data. This is not going to turn into like a conspiracy theory podcast. I don't know enough about the way websites use our data, but I know that billionaires don't really care about <laughs> your privacy and will happily sell your personal details to a company in order to sell you things. And if that means breaching your private life, then that really doesn't matter. Going into sex scene discourse, it's always just very annoying because a lot of it just comes down to personal disgust, a discomfort with sex and a desire that it shouldn't be discussed, shown, talked about. And that becomes very frustrating because I think a lot of people take that immediate emotional reaction to seeing sex as evidence of their morality, telling them to close their eyes, skip over, not to look, right? And I would say that you are obviously entitled to watch what you want and experience art in whatever way you want, but not being able to sit with your own discomfort and maybe interrogate it a bit is generally a bad sign. Because I think a lot of the time, stuff that brings us discomfort but doesn't actively harm us is a lot of the time our prejudices coming to the surface and being made to question you could be wrong about something is actually a very important part of engaging with anything but especially with art and I think watching a very long sex scene in a vacuum shouldn't 
have provoked this much controversy. <laughs> now I can get into why the sex scene doesn't quite work for me, but the fact that it's there at all, I don't think should have brought about this much <laughs> discourse especially because for the most part this wasn't like a very mainstream movie so this is like a french movie made by a mostly unknown director outside of france so the fact that it like crossed over and caused controversy is really interesting and i think a lot of the time that happens with sex and violence on screen for the most part and it's very rare that like western countries have like i'm gonna say it's rare but it's definitely not we don't perceive ourselves to be as scandalized by stuff like this so when it comes up, it's really, it's really interesting, quite strange. My personal opinion of the sex in this film is that it aligns with my opinion of the movie in general, which is that it feels quite emotionally void. So I don't know these characters really that well. The only things that really bring them to life are their performances. And that kind of goes for the sex scenes too because i don't think that inherently having a very long sex scene in your film makes it good but i also don't think it makes it bad like there's nothing there that really shocked me i guess i think it might have done when i was like 14 when i watched it for the first time i think for the most part it felt a little bit too choreographed which is a bit antithetical to the whole vibe of the movie which is meant to feel lived in and i think that is kind of like the crux of the film in general is that this film doesn't feel as though there's people in it despite what it's trying to convince me of and i'm gonna quote jules moreau who wrote the book and they did write a blog post at the time which has been deleted and i kind of want to respect the fact that someone could like change their mind about what they think or just like not want to be associated with the movie anymore but they did kind of say something quite interesting which was that the sex scene felt almost surgical a bit cold and that is interesting when it comes to discussing the movie because i think there is a dissonance between the inherent romantic tragedy that is the movie and the actual experience of watching it which is that i feel like adele is more alone in this relationship especially towards the end but even at the beginning it does feel as though she's being toyed with and messed about with and kind of dragged into this relationship that has the appearance of passion but no actual end result of it so what should be this like the emotional connection just ends up feeling very clinical and mechanical which is generally what the sex scenes also convey i'd say the first one where del is having a fantasy of having sex with emma while she's at home in her bedroom that one i kind of felt but the rest didn't really do that much in terms of like stirring emotions or desire <laughs> in a weird way it kind of works to evidence my point which is that this is not a symbiotic relationship it's more someone going through the motions of first love and trying to figure out how they're going to become an adult when they've been kind of put in this role of the muse of her first girlfriend where she's kind of trapped in this space where she was just trying to escape this world that felt childish and foreign to her. I think in a weird way the sex scenes in the film kind of work alongside that. You know just like an extra point, French people seem to have just like a I wouldn't say a more progressive but like a more open desire to depict sex which i'm not saying that like french culture is like a beacon of, of feminism or anything it feels like more of a stereotype but like french cinema just like being more willing to show what other countries might shy away from within the context of the film i think that adele uses gay sex as an antidote for the prescribed heterosexuality that she's expected to follow and i think this kind of comes after experiencing some desire towards men 
but ultimately feeling very unsatisfied with the end result. Within the context of the film, Emma kind of becomes this freedom, which, you know, I discussed earlier about the, the lesbian artist being like a more malleable, progressive figure that allows the protagonist to dip their toes into this kind of world without jumping in head first. It's hard to, I guess, pass by the end of the film. If we are meant to believe that Adele's attraction to women is a permanent thing or whether it was just specific to Emma. I don't enjoy giving bad faith interpretations even of directors that I don't particularly gel with but there is a certain cynicism towards the love between two women and how it's ultimately doomed to fail. At the same time there is this kind of relief that Adele has escaped this fairly selfish person who only ended up in a relationship with this girl much younger than her because she was cheating on her girlfriend at the time. Quite hard to pin down. Part of that seems intentional but considering how much footage they shot all together I don't know fully if it was. For the most part the sex scenes function in the film as evidence of their relationship. I wouldn't say they really cohere with most of the narrative. Unlike other people who watch this film, they don't feel that alien either. I think for me, it mostly just comes across as matter of fact. So I'm gonna read Richard Brody who wrote about the film, which I mostly agree with. I mean, particularly this quote. So he says this, when Kashish films Adele and Emma making love for the first time, he does so with one of the most jolting cuts in the recent cinema. From the women sitting together on a park bench to the two of them naked in bed, tangling erotically. The immediate continuity from public to private life, from intellectual and emotional contact to the most intimate physical contact, without the intermediate stages of seduction or proposition or the sexual teasing of anticipation or build-up of undressing is the film's very subject. In effect, Kashish philosophizes the lovers' bodies in the same way that he physicalizes their conversation. The dialectic of sex, with its tension and parries, its comedy and its fury, is as much a part of their being as is their discussion of art, food or family. <laughs> On lâche rien, 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 on lâche rien. Il nous parlait d'égalité, et comme des cons les a cru. I'm gonna quote Lucille Kearns again who says this, Is commercial exploitation of lesbianism really a cause for complaint? The obverse argument would be that anything that renders more visible, acceptable and even aspirational a practically invisible or stigmatised sexual identity should prompt applause rather than cavil. Lesbian thrills can become aspirational consumer options if the protagonists look just like canonically pretty straight girls. A lot of discussions about this film really do boil down to this is not what I want a lesbian film to look like. If you read enough discourse for enough time you will lose your fucking mind. But really is true of pretty much all queer media to ever be. If something is too mainstream then it's bad but if it's too subversive then it's also bad and there is no perfect representation of sexuality and we should be angry about everything all the time. Engaging with film criticism, and I'm using that word very loosely on the internet, <laughs> is a nightmare at times. But I do think there is something to be said about an acceptable, palatable version of queer sexuality. Lesbians in particular who have been very vilified for very often their gender performance but also just their attitudes towards their own sexuality with the continuous but in my opinion very unnecessary assertion that no they don't hate men that they are attracted to exclusively women and usually no one else. In order to I guess combat this the expression in the mainstream has been lesbians who are pretty white thin, able-bodied, cisgender, usually American, but that's like most movies, isn't it? And 
their conflict is about coming out and being attracted to women. Those are the types of stories that we see. A lot of these are tragedies, not all of them. I can say this is someone who has watched quite a lot of queer cinema. I know that there is a lot of lesbian period dramas that are tragedies and everyone's very tired of them. <laughs> but they're not all like that and it's not as simple as boiling it down to these categories, right? The question is what would a queer cinema look like? And typically, if you were to ask me, it's, it's a cinema that engages with the idea of gender presentation, gender identity and sexuality being transitory and in conversation with the modern moment and blue is the warmest color made an impact and positive or negative it is significant that a lot of the discussions about queerness at the time were to do with marriage rights and the rights to adopt children and the rights to be served by businesses and not be discriminated against. And this film actually goes out of its way to not have a story of a girl having to deal with a lot of homophobic violence. It's not that she doesn't experience any and I would say that having a toxic partner who's much older than you is also a, a trope in lesbian cinema. The desire to present this as matter of fact as possible was quite subversive at the time when there just like wasn't a lot of depictions of lesbians at all in the mainstream and I'd say that this film had a lot to say to straight people because it's clear that many lesbians just didn't like it which is not to say none did for me, it was just one of the first lesbian films I'd ever seen. That's just like true. I think I watched this on Netflix back when Netflix was not a shithole and I think I watched it completely by accident. I saw it was in the gay section. It might have been recommended under Orange is the New Black and I just watched it and it wasn't my favourite thing of all time but it was something close to what I'd been trying to figure out in my own head about myself. And I'm not necessarily saying that everyone has to be grateful for all representation. I'm definitely not. I'm, I found that I've become more <laughs> critical, mainly because I think I personally deserve to watch a good movie. We are alive for so little time and I don't want to waste my energy on something that isn't gonna you know bring me joy to analyze to think about I don't want I don't want slop I don't want to be pandered to and I think whether we like it or not I can't say that this was pandering to to anyone except maybe Kashisha's own fantasies of what lesbians are like because even if you do come here for the hot lesbian sex you have to sit through <laughs> like three hours of just women talking about nothing really. So if you can endure that and that's for you, then sure, why not? It was at least a drop in the bucket for what straight people were willing to sit through. <laughs> because a lot of people really like this. They had a lot to say about it. I know because I've read most of it, which is not to say that it is particularly subversive. I'm just saying that it appeared to be when literally no one else had been able to make something as popular as this. Now I'd say that it has a lot of the tenets of the lesbian drama. It's got like the experimentation with friends, the going to a gay club underage. You had like straight friends being convinced that you're attracted to them, having to lie to your parents about the fact that you're gay. The fact that Adele's parents ask Emma if she has a boyfriend when she walks into the house looking the way she does is, I think, is, is quite funny and I, I mentioned how I'd laughed a couple of times in this but I think just because this film if it wasn't a blueprint for the way lesbian films were going to look it at the very least influenced what people expected. I personally don't believe that there is anything inherently wrong with a film about queer women being very sexual, a film like this having a toxic relationship at the centre, a film about coming of age and realising that the world isn't kind of there to feed your 
appetite for learning and experiencing things and that if you are poorer than the people around you, you can end up making more mistakes in attempts to survive a world that is punishing you for existing. I wouldn't say that I like this film, but I do think that in spite of everything, I am quite grateful for the way that it seemed to make people discuss this kind of cinema and what it should look like. And I honestly think like a quote unquote bad film can be a good jumping off point for people to make much better films. Like something being mainstream and bad means that a lot of indie films can be both subversive and also good. I think it's finally time to ask the question, does the film look like a badger? I personally believe that films about lesbians or any queer women should have some interest in the interiority of the women on screen. Kashish often gestures at interesting ideas and even lingers on them for a long time but doesn't actually do anything interesting with them, especially his female characters who he seems to reduce to objects who are catty and don't like each other and I think he ultimately ends up suggesting that relationships between women are unsustainable. I really do struggle to hate this film, <laughs> but I don't think I've ever identified with it. And I'm quite certain a lot of queer women haven't either. If you already don't enjoy long rambling French films about the tragedy of love, then like the salacious lesbian sex is probably not going to entice you into it. <laughs> I do think the performances are very good. And I think on rewatch, I can see that this is more of a story about Adele rather than a relationship between two women. And Emma, in retrospect, mostly seems like a non-character in spite of Sado's performance. And I say that's a weakness of the writing rather than anything to do with the actual elements of the story. It does look like a badger. I don't think it can be denied at this point. The flaws are evident. The film is cursed. Salt the ground and walk away. But I'm not leaving you with nothing. I want to give some recommendations. Both of these films are French. So if you are eager to watch some French films, then you are prepared because here they are. So the first film is beats per minute and I say that this film does what Blue is the Warmest Colour wanted to do so much better. I think it's a lot more artful and a lot more delicate with its characters. So the plot of the film follows a group of AIDS activists in France who are trying to draw attention to the AIDS epidemic and in this context to men within this group they fall in love and they have a bunch of gay sex basically it follows their blossoming romance under the backdrop of a government that isn't taking the deaths of gay people very seriously and like i said i think this is a film that handles its subject with a lot of care and i think it works better as a romantic tragedy than this film does. The second recommendation is for Adele Exarchopolis fans. It's a film that came out fairly recently called The Five Devils. It's about a young girl who becomes increasingly frustrated the reappearance of her estranged aunt and the effect it seems to be having on her mother. And this frustration manifests in quite magical ways and I'm not gonna spoil anything but I hope that entices you because it's about a little girl <laughs> doing some magic and pulling some strings and it's a bit time bendy but it's a lot of fun and really interesting to think about and also gay. I'm gonna leave you because I feel like I've been talking for four years. I want to thank you very much for listening. I intend to be back shortly with more bonus episodes covering new releases, as well as my regularly scheduled deep dives. The next one is going to be published in April. If you'd like to stay updated, please make sure that you follow me on Twitter at like a badge pod. Follow me on Spotify, YouTube, and TikTok for full episodes and teasers. Make sure that you check out the bonus episodes I posted in January to hear my opinions on new queer releases. If you'd like to see more of my work, you can find my writing at ambercomwalk.com. And if you'd like to me money then you can donate to my coffee which i'll put in the description i have done more research than 
anyone should have ever done on anything ever. So if you'd like to read anything that I have quoted here today, all my sources are in the description. Thank you again for listening and I will see you in the next episode. Goodbye.